Hello, and welcome back to the Electronic Intifada podcast. I'm Nora Barrows Friedman. Liberalism has reached a comatose stage, and so has the West. The ravings that liberal intellectuals are, are ready to perform to justify their lust for violence in Palestine or their support for Nazi movements across the EU is indicative of the coming collapse. History moves in the direction of the South towards a horizon of prosperity for the majority of the world. The Palestinians and the axis of resistance are making an indomitable contribution to this historical movement. What a moment to be alive. Those are the words written by my guest, Mateo Omar Capasso, a fellow at Columbia University's Department of Middle Eastern, South Asian and African Studies and the managing editor at Mideast Critique. Mateo is also the author of Everyday Politics in the Libyan Arab Gemma Haria. Mateo, it's so good to finally have you on the Electronic Intifada podcast. Thank you so much, Nora, for having me. So uh, those words that I read, you posted on Twitter uh, a few days ago about liberalism in the context of the U.S.-Israeli genocide in Gaza yeah. and how the so-called civilized West in this moment is in a death spiral. Um, I, yeah. I wanted to bring you on to talk about the moment that we're in and how we should be looking at the broader picture of um, how the West defends the indefensible genocide of Palestinians and, and really what this shows us. What have you been uh, thinking about? In <sighs> Thanks. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here with you guys. I mean, you're doing such an amazing work trying to you know, to keep us updated. Uh, and, uh, and in that process, you know, it's really amazing how you're also providing us, uh, you all at Electronic Intifada, the, you know, the tray of hope and, uh, and you know, a needed uh, uh, support to understand what is happening on the ground. So it's really a pleasure to be exchanging this, uh, this you know, these ideas with you. Nora, we are living, I think, uh, an, um, an unprecedented moment in uh, history. I don't think we've ever, uh, you know, uh, been able, or we will ever be able to digest the pace and the significance of the genocide that this colonial entity, Western colonial entity, uh, which goes by the name of Israel, is actually to undertaking uh, in, the, in the territory of the Gaza Strip. It is uh, unprecedented because what we're seeing is a complete, is a, a total moment of decay and decline. It's a political decline, but it's also a moral decay of the West, which is intensified when we look at Palestine because uh, it really it, it is really taking the the form of a genocide, un, you know, perpetrated by by the Zionist. So you see, when we talk about Europe. Uh, and as a currently, you know, we're also talking about the US because there is an umbilical cord between these two social and political formations. We're constantly bombarded by this idea, you know, by the what I call the, the media. But when I say the media, I am talking about those media who have a direct interest to function as, a, as an extended arm of the ruling class. So the bourgeois media. So the media are telling us that what is happening in Ukraine, what is happening in Palestine, and I am sure that our ruling classes would be very happy to see this happening in Taiwan as well. What is happening in these regions of the world is a fight to protect our values, our liberal and democratic values. So we have this idea, and Netanyahu came out also talking about this, the light, you know, this is the forces of light against the forces of darkness. And the same is happening with NATO in Ukraine. So Ukraine wants to become a liberal democracy uh, like other countries of the European Union, but Russia, the dictatorship is not allowing this. On the contrary, you know, the leftists are even saying that Russia has imperial ambitions, it's gonna take up the whole of Europe. Now, in the case of Israel, it's already the only liberal democratic country in a region of dictators. So it must be defended because it incarnates our uh, democratic values. This premise is important to understand because uh, what keeps coming out of our European ruling classes and the media, that the agents who administer this narrative for them, is the word liberalism and democracy. Now, we've gotten so used to these two words that basically we've lost their meaning. And I refer to the facts and contradictions that cumulatively have uh, determine the rise of what we call liberalism. So what is liberalism really? What is a liberal democracy? That's, this is why we need to go back to this. And I think that, and also 
what you know how does liberalism emerge what does it mean is it europe li really a liberal democracy and for that matter the us well the short answer obviously is no but why because liberalism refers uh, philosophically at least to this idea of negative freedom which is uh, individual inviolable affirmation of freedom from uh, the interference by the state or whatever else i can marry whoever i want i can do business as much as i want the state should not be interfering in these affairs now and this is why also you know there has been uh, like a big backlash with the pandemic because you know why would the state interfere so much in our lives it's incredible so the problem lies in the fact that liberalism as an idea and as a political praxis as well arose as a celebration not of universal freedom, which it claims though to do, but of a well-defined community of people. Because when we look at the, and this is there's fantastic work done by numerous academics, one of them also an Italian one being Domenico Losurdo, I mean, Joseph Massad also has written about this. It's basically, when you look at the most influential thinkers of Tocqueville and others, uh, and John Locke about liberalism, everybody describes liberalism as a privilege of a white supremacist circle of people. And this consolidated in the US and the UK. So what does it mean, liberalism, as, uh, as the privilege of, a, of an elite? It means that uh, there are constitutive elements to liberalism that uh, are hidden, put on the side, which defined liberalism from its, from its, you know, when it was born. Basically, the genocide of the natives in the US take, uh, are perpetrated by the Europeans and the slavery of black Africans. So in other words, colonialism, plundering and genocide are constitutive elements of this political and ideological movement. So all this, uh, the, you know, the, the slaves and the, and the natives were completely excluded from this. And what we are seeing now happening, you fast forward this, despite there has been, uh, and we can talk about this, there have been changes to liberalism as a concept. It has been able to, to you know, to include more but this is precisely how liberalism, uh, you know, in a way dupes it, the, the masses because it gives an idea that it can change, that is something inherent inside liberalism, that, you know, that we don't have slavery anymore. Well, it was because Haiti had a revolution, which was an anti-slavery revolution. It's because we had the revolution in 1917 by Vladimir Lenin and the Russians and, and the, you know, and the communists that pushed against certain limits that liberalism and imperialism had put in place. But this is not recognized, obviously. The liberal world was, a, was forced to accept these material victories, often gained through armed struggle. So what we're seeing now, it's exactly the story repeating itself in different forces with a different connection, obviously, one between Israel and the US that is, you know, we cannot find back in the days uh, of the 14th and 16th century. But what we're seeing is an anti-colonial struggle that is pushing for a renewed engagement of what the world, the meanings of humanity and world order stand for, but it's finding this massive backlash and the complete normalization of genocide and plundering. Exactly, and, and the way that um these Western countries, you know, first and foremost, the U.S. Um, is is so condescending and paternalistic about uh, Palestinians and their right to defend themselves. Um, you know, I mean, they just said just earlier this week at the U.N. Security Council, you know, in 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 trying to justify their veto of of a. a a very, you know, a mild ceasefire resolution. Uh, the U.S. said, you know, this is not in the best interests of the Palestinians while they're being slaughtered, while hospitals are being leveled, while children are dying from uh, from uh, malnutrition and yeah. and a lack of food, that a starvation that is being engineered by the Israelis in the U.S. Um, you know, how does how does that 
how does this keep working? How does the the cycle of like you know the notion of liberal democracy right now keep working with you know with with the corporate media as as the arm as the platform? Um, you know, I just think about all of these you know very well meaning liberal you know white people yeah. here in the U.S. and and in Europe who you say oh it's so bad what's happening in in you know to palestinians but you know what else is israel supposed to do um how how does this keep happening what's at the core of it at the core of it i think we find two processes that they need to be understood in a way dialectically meaning uh, there is uh, uh, you know there um by dialectic, I mean, you know, this idea that there is a, a material relation that unites, that makes Israel central to the project of domination, of, to the Western project of domination of the world, which does exist. And uh, then there is the, from there, it emerges or it, it is, you know, uh, it, it comes, you know, it, it is uh, organic to this material project, the ideological component that, uh, that then eventually we find in these uh, arms of the ruling class that propagate this narrative, which it's, you know, the mainstream media. So to go back to, to basically to the material relation, what needs to be understood is that what is happening in Palestine is not something that has to do with uh, two peoples for two states or uh, the Muslim people vis-a-vis -vis the Christians vis-a-vis -vis the Jewish people. This is an identitarian framing that uh, it's not helpful and it's obviously very convenient to take in order not to realize what are the stakes and what is the core issue of uh, of, uh, of the situation in Palestine. The issue is, a, is the, you know, emanates, emerges from the, from the what is the American project. The American project or Western-led project is a project that usually is called imperialism. And by that, I mean a system where there is a material exploitation of the South by countries of the North, which happens in collaboration with the, uh, bourgeois elements, ruling segments of the south of the world. So there is a material relation of exploitation. How does this take place? Through military policies, economic policies. You don't accept, you don't do what I am I'm asking you to do. You don't open up your country. I'm going to come and do a regime change. Uh, or I impose sanctions on you, which is definitely one of these features that you know unites all the elements of the axis of resistance by the way now ideologically uh what we see is that uh, uh these countries are under an, uh, also another type of war an ideological war which can use also the you know includes the use of uh, unfortunately of uh, progressive ideas that could be progressive delinked from liberalism which are like the ideas of gender gender violence which you know we've seen this happening right now in the us and in the un the way it has been completely weaponized to create this monstrous you know uh, entity being uh, the palestinians resistance faction now for this project of american imperialism to consolidate in the world after world war ii it was necessary to reconfigure, to integrate different parts of the region according to the needs of, uh, of US interests. The Arab region had a specific interest. Why? Because there was oil. Oil represented uh, a key, a crucial element for the maintenance, the sustainment of, uh, of the, finance, the dollarized economy of the US. And so they needed to control this region. How did they do that? Through two main and faithful allies. The reactionary Gulf monarchies, whose role, the speakable role they're playing right now, we can see, and Israel. And so this is where Israel becomes so central, because Israel from 1943 to 2003 has been showered with military aid and all kinds of loans, uh, up to 260,000 billions, which, uh, you know, the Israelis have medical insurance, which you guys don't have. The Israelis are provided with everything. Why does this take place? 
Well, because Israel is an investment. It's, there are two key outposts for imperialism in the world. One is Israel and the other one is Taiwan. And they are central to the dominance of U.S. imperialism in the world. So the moment the Palestinians attack or defend themselves vis-a-vis -vis this colonial occupation that is financed by the West, then the whole world goes up in arms. Yeah, uh, and and also at the same time, and you mentioned this, the resistance of ac uh, the axis of resistance um, is building momentum as well. I mean, we saw uh, just you know just in the last couple months how uh, the Yemeni armed forces are. Um, you know, are are holding steadfast in in this uh, Red Sea blockade against Israeli ships and commerce, um, and and of course we you know we see Hezbollah um, you know yeah. uh, in Lebanon and uh, you know talk about how the axis of resist what it is um, yeah. and how it fits into this context as as counter hegemonic to yeah. the the aims of western imperialism uh, with israel at its core yeah uh, exactly because you know thank you for framing it in this way because that's precisely it, it, the needed frame to understand what it's happening because the moment you understand that there is an imperialist structure which is simply, the, you know, the acceptance that there are hierarchies in the world system. And the West has been at the top of this since the 14th century, due to a history of genocides and force, basically. Now the West is declining, obviously. So, and this is where the spaces for resistance come, and, you know, the cracks are opening up. But Israel has a central role. It's an investment in militarism. So Israel is important to be there because we can control the region. At the same time, by controlling the region, we can crush any form of developmental and political force that emerges from the region in order to challenge the project of imperialism. This happened back in the days of in the 60s and the 70s and the from the 50s to the 70s. This is how the project of Pan-Arabism was uh, defeated militarily, with sanctions, with wars, with two wars against Israel. So Pan-Arabism, in a way, tried to fight against the project of imperialism, but didn't manage to, to, to win, to assert itself and to change the equation of force in the region. But fast forward all these years, as and you see that with the decline of... Uh, of Pan-Arabism, another axis slowly started to come out of the region. And by axis, I mean simply a collective of social political forces who understand that in order to achieve national liberation, so national independence from a political and economic point of view, you need to strategize collectively, come together and ally, and create a different model and fight, obviously, challenge the oppressor, the foreign invaders, so imperialism. And this is where Palestine becomes so central. It's per history, it's an historical necessity. It's not that the Palestinians are unique, although this is all this propaganda around the Holy Land, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. It's ideological, but there is a material premise to this. This is why it's so important. And so what is the axis? The axis is composed by five actors, uh, main, you know, who are Iran, the state of Iran, the Islamic Republic, Hezbollah in Lebanon, Ansarullah, which means the government of Yemen, uh, the Qatar Hezbollah and other uh, um, uh, factions in Iraq, and obviously Syria, the, uh, the, Repu the, Ara the Syrian Ar Arab Republic, and obviously the Palestinian factions all those that have been labeled terrorist. So obviously not the Palestinian Authority, but uh, Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. Now, what do the, the, the mainstream will not want to tell you that there is something uniting, keeping, gluing these different forces. 
The idea is that everybody is a puppet, puppet of Iran, okay? They are all acting according to the interests of Iran. Everybody's doing what Iran says, you know, we know the story there. But uh, each one of them, what do they have in common? They have in common that each one of them has been crushed by the forces of imperialism on uh, throughout history. Hezbollah emerges after the invasion of Lebanon in 1982. The popular mobilization unit in Iraq emerged emerge after numerous invasion of Iraq and bombing of Iraq, especially the 2003 one, and the creation of ISIS, which was another fundamental arm of the, of the material and political struggle that imperialism waged on, on the Arab region and West Asia. Syria. Syria, there was a regime change attempt uh, in 2000, uh, from 2011 again and onward, trying to destabilize completely Syria, to cut the supply lines for the resistance. Iran has been under sanctions for decades. So how are we you know, surprised by the fact that all these countries come together and they realize that, uh, look, we are all fighting a common enemy here. That enemy is Western imperialism. They don't want us to develop. They don't want us to be liberated. And Yemen is the same. Wars since 2003 with the war on terror up to 2015, you know, spearheaded by the Gulf countries with Western support. And, uh, you know, in all this, what, uh, how are we going to really not... Uh, you know, understand the centrality of Palestine. Again, there is a centrality of the Zionist project to imperialism. Imperialism is an obstacle to the liberation and to the, and to the economic and political and social development of the region. So inevitably, Palestine becomes central for this. It, it's, uh, it's, it's astonishing. Um to you know just just to, i mean i know you were talking with rania halek about this recently on her show um which i encourage everyone to go and check out um just the 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 this this very normalized demonization of iran that just is you know a given um and then by proxy you know the the the, the forces against western imperialism from palestine to yemen yes. uh, to iraq and syria and lebanon and um, it, it's just, I, I mean, it, 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 um, it, there's something about also how, you know, when, when Western liberals talk about the Palestinian resistance as, you know, being agents of Iran and they don't, um, you know, they're not, they're not fighting for their people. They're actually, their people hate them. Um, and, and they're just doing this because Iran is telling them to, uh, this is just, accepted i mean there's this there's this normalized uh anti-arab racism yeah. and a normalized um kind of a a, a fetishization mm -hmm. of you know when we see uh for example the the people who backed regime change in syria and and their rallying cry was you know syrian listen to syrians um you know there there's uh, what about syrian agency well they were talking about the agency of the elite and it's also applicable when we talk about, um, you know, when liberals talk about Palestinians, yeah. um, where they, you know, they they just listen to the ones that are helping the the U.S. Uh, led project, um, and you know, the so so can you talk really about the the moral struggle of yeah. the resistance axis and how? the perception of resistance is only really valued if it is militarized, you know, Western states doing the violence, dropping the bombs. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always thinking about that meme of like, uh, you know, an F-16 fighter jet dropping missile, you know, a, a US fighter jet dropping missiles uh, on, you know, an, an Arab country, uh, but it has like the rainbow flag on the, on the tail of the plane. Um, you know, a kinder, gentler imperialism. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Could you talk about that a little bit? I mean, I think I would probably go back or start by, you know, picking up on what you were saying about the relationship between uh, uh, 
liberalism as again as an ideology and uh, and and Islam. Why I think this is important. I think it's important because uh, the moment we understand the connection, the trans between uh, liberalism and colonialism, and so the idea that liberalism is basically about the protection of individual freedom of a tiny and privileged minority, which back in the days was a white supremacist elite, and now it's the, the elite of the West, basically. Then we know that this liberalism is premised on the violent exclusion and killing of others. But when we move to the question of Palestine and Iran and the Axis as a whole, Islam then becomes central here to understand. But Islam becomes central to liberalism in various ways. Why? Uh, and I mean, uh, you know, you know, there is Joseph Massa who has this beautiful book called Islam and Liberalism, where he explains this at length. But it's important to go back to this because uh, basically European Western liberalism has always projected onto Islam all its most uh, vicious and violent aspects, accusing mu Muslim of being backwards, misogynist, fanatics, patriarchal. So there is a sort of fixation on Islam, which allows to create a picture at this on, in turn of liberal, of liberal values as uh, universal, democratic, progressive, something the world of Muslims should embrace to come out of their despotic past and violent present. I mean, we all know the reason why, for example, Afghanistan was invaded under the premise that we needed to liberate and bring freedom to, to, the, to the women of Afghanistan. We know the story about the struggle of women in Iran, which was used and, you know, weaponized for, for a potential regime change operation. And we're seeing now liberal heroes, Western feminist heroes, like Hillary Clinton condemning Hamas, as we were saying about the sexual violence, without any proofs whatsoever. Now, liberalism now, the issue with liberalism is that uh, on the one hand has shown its capacity to create these monstrous pictures of, of Islam and, uh, and the culture, the religion, the, you know, Islamic culture is, is, uh, and, and the religion of Islam. On the other hand, and this is, you know, go back to the material element and understanding the importance of the material premise of the ideology is that liberalism has had absolutely no problem to cooperate, collaborate with and fund the most reactionary interpret interpreters of Islam in order to make sure that the material basis required to sustain the imperialist privilege Again, we go back to this tiny minority, which is at the premise of, idea, of the idea of liberalism and as, as an imperialist element, are kept in place. So, and this has happened over and over again throughout the history of liberalism. It's not unique to the West uh, Asian region, to the Arab region. Why? Because you blame and cast mo the Muslim as monstrous or as the most horrifying elements of society, Yet you fund consistently Wahhabi Islam that is emanating from the Gulf and it is very central to undermine this uh, social political project like Pan-Arabism back in the days that was central to the challenge to imperialism. But this has happened in Europe as well. And this is where, you know, we cannot understand anything, you know, we, or, or to better say, we could understand so easily what is happening in, in Palestine, in the region, if we would have a, 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 you know, a right, rightful understanding of our own history. Why? Because uh, we know, when the moment you mention the word Nazism, the West goes up in shock. Okay? But when you look at the progressive historical, uh, you know, cumulatively, uh, cumulative operations that the U.S. has done in Europe and with the Western, you know, with ruling age segments of the elites of Europe in which Nazis were rehabilitated as liberals, as progressive elements of society in order to fight communism, we are seeing exactly the same dynamic at play here. What needs to be uh, remained unchallenged is the system of production, the material basis which is obviously capitalism and imperialism.
And in this, I have to say, there is this is precisely where, you know, there is, I know in the US is stronger in a way, but it's coming to Europe as well. This uh, false dichotomy existing between liberalism and fascism. Liberals, by history, I know this is going to sound crazy probably for many, but they are fascist. They were a tiny white minority. They are the tiny elite of the West that does not want the global South to change the, you know, the rules of the game. So there is fascism in all this. It's a tiny oligarchy controlling everything with absolute power. And it is a fundamental point. You know why? Because liberals remain always in the discourse, as you were saying, how do they manage to continue to discuss these things? And it's on and on. Because they remain in the realm of identity. And they divorce any discussion from the material reality. So this is why liberalism reproduces itself. It calls for an expansion of that elite group. Let's bring a Muslim in. Let's bring a woman in. Let's bring a, a bold guy in. Whatever. So basically, by doing so, you're trying to show that you can actually add an expanded circle of privileges, but you make sure at the same time that none of these elements you are bringing in, they want to expand that circle even more. And this is why there is an historical relevance of socialism in this moment, communism, and the anti-colonial struggles, which have always pushed for a different type of spiritual, ideological, and material struggles. And the axis of resistance is part of this. But the West is too liberal to understand that. Mm -hmm. For now. Um, <laughs> that's uh, Matteo Omar Capasso. Matteo, um, I wanted to get your reaction to this uh, video of the Chinese ambassador uh, to the UN during these um, uh, hearings at the International Court of Justice in The Hague. All right, uh, so this was um, February 22nd, Thursday, and this is China's representative addressing the ICJ on the consequences of Israeli occupation. That's uh, that's what the Chiron from Al Jazeera says. The UNGA resolution 3070 of 1973, I quote, reaffirms the legitimacy of the people's struggle for liberation from colonial and foreign domination and the alien subjugation by all available means, including armed struggle, end of quote. This recognition is also reflected in international convention. For example, the Arab Convention for Suppressing of Terrorism of 19. 98 affirms, I quote, the right of peoples to combat foreign occupation aggression by whatever means, including armed struggle, in order to liberate the territories and secure the right to self-determination and independence, end of quote. So, you know, uh, uh, you know, and and China has had uh, some some uh, uh, you know some some good uh, efforts at at diplomatic um, yeah. you know, but uh, you know, they're still kind of beholden to this two state kind of framework. Um, but you know, but that statement right there to have a major world power. Yeah. Um, that that you know is consistently demonized by the West uh, because of its economic um, uh, strength and power over the West um, to reaffirm Palestinians' right to armed self-defense. Um, what is the significance of that? What does it tell us about about where the the rest of the world, so demonized by the West, is looking at Palestine? Exactly. This is, I think. Uh... This is uh, this is the core issue here. What we're seeing, people understand that what's happening in Palestine is uh, is outrageous, is unprecedented, and it's a crime. But it's not the West that is responding to this uh, call for change. You know, for a call to stop these crimes. It's actually the West that is perpetrating them. But at the same time, 
there are states of the South. There are different social and political formations from the South that are emerging and they are calling for a different world order. One that is, you know, where everybody sits at the table in an equitable manner and in mutually prosperous way. Now, what the, the Chinese representative said today, it's actually, yes, it is inscribed in the United Nations, you know, general resolution in the General Assembly. And uh, as uh, all the violations of uh, Israel are inscribed, not even in, in, in UN General Assembly resolution, but in UN Security Council resolution, but they've never been taken up. They've never been enforced. So the tools for uh, an equitable world order do exist in a way that is what China is reminding us. But what China is reminding us as well is that uh, the south of the world understands this uh, genocidal killing, this uh, appetite for militarism and wars and violence that the West is showing. And they understand also that what is happening in Palestine is a colonial struggle. And this is where, you know, we go back to the liberal condemnation that went, you know, like, uh, like a plague right after October 7th, which was, do you condemn Hamas? Hamas. If anybody has pick up a book on uh, anti-colonial history or colonial history, will find out that colonized people face an historical necessity, which is self-preservation. They are locked in, uh, in time for, for the colonizers. They have no past because they are, be, you know, this land is ours now. They have no future. You're not coming back here. You're not going to have a state. And they are stuck in a present where they need to be consistently crushed in all ways possible. So to regain their humanity, to regain their moral capacities, to regain their spiritual and political consciousness, Armed struggle has always been there as one of the many options to face a colo colonialism. But nobody wants to talk about colonialism because it would inevitably then justify what is happening. It's not just justify, just simply understand that what is happening, it's been a crime that goes back to the 1920s, it, is continu it continues, and there have been different waves of Palestinian factions facing this historical necessity and having to act upon it. And China is obviously, I mean, I always say that nobody's doing enough considering the pace and the significance of what is happening right now. But it's also indicative if China has done this statement. Why? Because China has had an unprincipled, no, sorry, a principled position against, for example, economic sanctions. And uh, by, you know, not abiding to the numerous sanctions, economic uh, forms of warfare that the U.S. has imposed on different countries of the global south, being then Venezuela, being then Cuba or uh, Iran, China structurally and historically has played a fundamental role in supporting Iran's political, military and economic capacities. And these capacities eventually trickle down as well to the axis. So we can see historically, we can really admire the moment we are living, which is a moment where the South is, has been consistently and communitively realizing that we need a new world order. We need to own this moment and we need to ask for different terms and different rules. They are basically showing agency according to the liberals. But, you know, they're not going to be happy with this type of agency. Yeah, it's not the one that they've prescribed. Um, Matteo, uh, let's talk a little bit about Yemen uh, and their, what Ali calls their humanitarian intervention in the Red Sea as yeah. a response to Israel's and the U.S.'s barbaric genocide. And how this is perceived, um, what, what can you make of, of Yemen's stance right now? Yemen, I think, is it, it is indeed a humanitarian intervention. That's the right word. Yemen, Ansar Allah, 
have uh, stood as the most moral army really in the world literally because on the face of the genocide the world uh, must act to stop these crimes okay because what we're living is unprecedented i don't need to repeat the numbers of what it's happening it's horrifying yemen like many others anyway but yemen as uh, as this unique uh, capacity to to magnetize you know our sense of morality and spirituality why because yemen has been under decades of wars decades it has suffered so much from 2004 then back in 2015 and now we are seeing uh, like uh, live happening right now that the population has suffered for more than 20 years for foreign us-led and western-led war and aggression raising up to a moral standard that the west can has lost it's unimaginable for the west to think that for western elites that the poorest people of the world can come and face this genocide so again what does this tell us and we go back to what you were saying before nora that uh, this is definitely as a, a war a struggle being led by the south ideologically morally mili militarily that they want to rewrite the, loose, the, uh, the, the rules of the international order. And at the same time, it shows that Palestine is also a war on the poor. And that's why everybody understands immediately that, you know, this is a crime. This shouldn't be happening. And the poorest people, materially the poorest people, are rising up to face this because they know what it means to be there. And they know that, you know, that there is clearly a challenge faced to their own liberation, political, economic, moral, spiritual, and they have to do something. And so this naval blockade that they have done, it's literally, it's amazing, you know, to see that they have managed to, to block a choke point of trade to help Palestine. But obviously the mainstream media is not going to tell us that this is why it's happening. And going back to China, China is at being affected by this blockade but it, that it didn't take an hostile stance against the resistance. Right. I mean, a, a lot of the goods that are that that come in through the Red Sea um, and go to Israel uh, or Israel, you know, proxies um, comes from China. Yeah. And and yeah, it's it's interesting to see how that how that has has kind of. Uh, intensified as well, yes. um, how how, the, you know, the. Yemeni government, uh, Ansar Allah, has been very um, defiant uh, of of U.S. aggression, of aggressive politics, of the saber rattling, of of the bombing um, that that the U.S. has done. Um, what what does that teach us? What what can what do we draw from that? I think what do we draw probably i would think like uh, in uh, in uh, in probably four major points that come to my mind you know like uh, at least uh, the first two is that uh, what's happening right now it's a colonial struggle it's uh, a struggle for liberation and uh, the moment we set and we understand clearly what it's happening then everything becomes easier for us. Because this is, again, it's not Israel-Palestine. This is a war of liberation undertaken by the Palestinians in the face of a colonial, you know, of colonialism, which inevitably involves a regional alliance. Because that's the only way that can happen. Because the whole region is choked. So you're not going to liberate Palestine through NGO meetings. You're going to have, and you're going to need eventually, as history has shown us, different forms of struggle, including the armed struggle. Then this teaches us that the resistance has developed a capacity to, to organize themselves, to stay true to their spiritual, ideological, and moral values and put, by developing a long-term political horizon, which we have lost in the West. We can, you know, our ruling elites cannot plan the next four years. So 
you know, this this struggle is that then is material and ideological, obviously. And in all this, you realize the importance of uh, of having allies, of acting, uh, you know, with other social political forces, because you cannot do this alone. And again, this is so important because one of the most, uh, you know, problematic things that happened into history was the liquidation of the Palestinian struggle, not as a regional struggle, but as a national one. As just this is just the issue of the Palestinians; they will resolve it. It's not, um, you know, it's just per history's necessity and mandate. It's not just a Palestinian struggle; it's a regional one, and it, this is becoming so clear. The war. What was the aim of the wars of Yemen? What was the aim of the war on Syria? What was the aim on on Iran? Why hasn't been the Gulf attacked or uh, uh, the regime change operation? It's clear. It was a war for Israel. A war for Israel means a war for the U.S.-led project. So we are seeing this, and this, as you were saying, this intensification of contradictions and conflict are also providing a clarity to the path forward. And we have to thank the South and the Axis for this, because Palestine is providing us really a moment to rethink also our, you know, our place into history. I think that's a perfect place to leave it. Matteo Omar Capasso, you are a fellow at Columbia University's Department of Middle Eastern, South Asian and African Studies and the managing editor at Mideast Critique. You're also the author of Everyday Politics in the Libyan Arab Jamar Haria. Uh, Matteo, it's so great uh, to, to have had this opportunity to have this conversation with you and um, please come back soon. No, Roman, it's the pleasure is mine indeed. Thanks for watching this video. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, hit like, leave a comment. These engagements help us with the YouTube algorithm and it helps us to get around Silicon Valley censorship as much as possible. It does make a difference. You can also support our journalism by going to electronicintifada.net and clicking on donate now. Thank you.